Thanks for joining everyone this panel on the perils of remote exam proctoring software. Um, this is a particularly timely issue since the... Can you hear me? Is my mic on? Hello. I think so. But I, I don't want to have to like hold it yeah, like Scott this. Can, Scott yeah. turn it up. <laughs> Mine doesn't have a prophylactic. Okay. Oh. I <laughs> don't know if it matters, but... Okay. I just noticed. Is that better? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining the Perils of Remote Exam Proctoring Software panel. Um, this is a particularly timely issue since the pandemic started. We saw like a proliferation of remote uh, proctoring software pop up, um, and it was something that was a, a big concern to a lot of people. Um, so I think a good place to start is to introduce the panelists. Uh, Haley, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm Senior Legislative Activist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, my day-to-day -day job involves uh, basically project managing uh, the state legislative work that we do. Um, prior to coming to EFF, I was a journalist at the Washington Post for about eight years covering technology. So really happy to be here. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Null. I am the uh, Privacy and Data Director at Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a, a nonprofit policy group based in DC that works on a wide variety of different policy issues, privacy obviously, um, freedom of expression, First Amendment issues, surveillance, etc. Um, and most of the work on this issue is actually part of a team called the Civic Tech Team, Civic Tech, Equity and Civic Tech Team, so I'm going to be channeling my co-workers during this call. Hi, I'm Teddy Fishman. I am usually involved in academic integrity work. I was the director of the International Center for Academic Integrity for almost a decade, and now I work mostly with the European Network on Academic Integrity. And when I'm not doing that, I'm also sometimes the flying spaghetti monster. And then I am Bailey Sanchez. Um, I work at Future Privacy Forum, a nonprofit that believes that technological innovation and uh, strong privacy safeguards can coexist, and in particular, work on the youth and education team. So, this is an issue that I um, have been paying uh, quite close attention to. So, I think a good place to start is just defining like what we here in the panel mean is remote proctoring. Um, proctoring is not something new. I think we can all maybe remember when we took the SATs and we had proctors like walking up and down the halls. Um, I think some of us also in college maybe remember when we had the, um, the exam software that would just like lock down your computer to where all you can do is like access what's in the document. Um, but the proctoring software that we're going to talk about today is a little more sophisticated. Uh, so Eric, do you want to... Uh, kick us off with what we mean by remote proctoring typically in this case? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, this, you know, when you think about having taken a test, if you've taken a standardized test or whatever, yeah, you have a proctor or a teacher in the front of the room and they are generally monitor monitoring everyone for signs of cheating and uh, that's sort of par for the course. For online learning and yeah, while COVID did exacerbate this, this is not an issue, it's been around for a long time. And uh, so basically what you're trying, what companies are trying to do is replace the human proctor with either a form of software that usually uses artificial intelligence or some sort of algorithm to uh, detect whether someone is cheating or whether there are different, you know, different indices of, of cheating, or it will actually be a Per, uh, an actual proctor person who is, uh, you know, might have remote access to the device or will be at, at the very least talking to the test taker to say, okay, now, you know, show me your ID next to your face and then show me the room you're in, et cetera, et cetera, to try to make, to try to cut down on um, cheating. Obviously, this is the main goal of having uh, a remote proctor around. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's basically taking what we used to have, which was an in person. Uh, person at the front of the room who would walk around and then making that person electronic uh, and if you want to do it at scale you basically have to use artificial intelligence to uh, so you don't have to have you know a proctor for every single student that's taking the exam uh, you could have a piece of software that will automatically flag certain uh, you know eye movements or head movements or if you're talking to yourself they might think you're talking to somebody else etc. Um, yeah, that's that's what that's what I mean when I'm talking about 
exam proc. Yeah, does exam anyone else have anything to add? I think you did a good job covering. I'd just say that sometimes it's also combined with some kind of a biometric monitoring. So it might be keystroke logging or you know something like that that also monitors you in a different way, not just looking at you, but also recording other things that you're doing that are identified with you. Yeah, uh, I actually took the the bar exam, the exam that you need to become a lawyer. I took that remotely, and so the hmm. the features that I engaged with were it um, it was AI. There was no person, but I did have to hold up my ID um, to verify that it was me that was taking the exam. Um, and then I also there was allegedly uh, I don't know like how again I don't know like how accurate it is or how much someone monitored, but allegedly there was like like eye gaze tracking um, because the the thought is I guess the more you look away from the screen the more likely you are to be cheating or to be up to something nefarious um, but I think there's a lot of uh, disagreement on you know how accurate that is because again like the more the more tools you introduce the more um, algorithms you introduce uh, you have to really make sure that they're they're doing what they purport to be doing like because ultimately the goal is like Eric said to keep people um, from cheating but does monitoring eyes uh, help that cause perhaps perhaps not uh, <laughs> um, yeah so that's uh, that's what we mean today when we're talking about remote exam proctoring is kind of the more like um, AI based tools um, so we talked about how cheating is a goal. So are there any, any other benefits to remote proctoring or any other positives that we've seen? Um, well, I, you know, not to, <laughs> not to, <laughs> to play devil's, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit, right? I mean, I think when people are um, looking at remote proctoring and when they're kind of drawn to the product, what they, you know, so obviously they want to be able to um, <coughs> make sure that people aren't cheating. So that's like kind of the primary one. But I, I do think there's some question of like, if you are unable to make it to a test to a physical testing site, you know, it's a it's an option, perhaps to uh, give people some assurance about the, the result of a test that you might take, it enables people to, to take tests, um, you know, outside of a physical location that that they have to they have to drive to or they have to make their way to. So there are some I suppose, uh, you know, <laughs> arguments for um, accessibility, for equity in some ways. Um, but of course, there are many, many uh, trade-offs that you, that you get with a, with a remote proctor. But I think that's, that's the main thing that we hear, right? It's like, it makes it easier for us to administer tests to more people. Yeah, and I think the, it definitely, it definitely has allowed universities to continue to operate in a fairly similar manner uh, during COVID, it reduces the spread of COVID because you're allowed to stay home instead of being forced to go into an in-person location. Um, and I th and I'll talk about disability discrimination a little bit later. But if someone has a mobility-based disability, then obviously it allows them to be able to take the test without having to, um, you know, travel to a, a certain location to um, to take the test. And from a student conduct perspective, people who are proponents of this usually say that if a student is on the fence, like they they aren't really, they're not sold on the <coughs> idea of cheating, but they haven't really, you know, decided that they're absolutely not going to cheat. You know, if they know that somebody is going to be um, have access to watching them or that a tape can be reviewed, you know, if, if there's any suspicion, then that will tip them over to the side of you know behaving rightly. Yeah, so as you can see, there are uh, some benefits. And again, this was uh, really ramped up during the pandemic when a lot of schools had to make decisions fairly quickly um, and in normal circumstances, like might have taken more time to do some vetting, but really had like almost overnight, we all remember, like we thought like, okay, well, we'll close up the, the offices in the schools for two weeks and then be back. Um, and as we know, that is not how things panned <laughs> out. Um, so we uh, the pandemic happened, uh, a lot of schools were closed down, uh, remote proctoring was in a lot more schools than it was before. Um, what what problems or risks have we seen in the last couple of years with remote proctoring? I feel like I should let the lawyers go first, but the first <laughs> one that comes to mind for me as somebody who works with educators is just the the possibility of things that should be private because they're in the student's own room just not only being seen but also being recorded right um, and in the cases where there are live proctors 
those proctors have to make a decision about what's, you know, what, what am I mandated to report? And in some cases, the people who are proctoring are actually mandated reporters. So if they see anything dangerous and they have to make that call. So it's, it's not only like the invasion of the student's privacy initially, but also the whole range of questions that the person who is proctoring has to decide about, like maybe this thing isn't related to this test at all. Maybe I see, you know, a copy of Mein Kampf and also a pistol on the student's um, shelf, you know what I mean? Is that illegal? No. Should I report it to somebody? I don't know. And because of the risk of liability, this is why I think I should let the lawyers answer this, um, you know, often they'll just aim on the side of, of passing that information along to somebody else and then everybody else, you know, who has access to that information compounds the problem of the violation of the student's privacy. Um, another thing I point to is that, uh, you know, a lot of, so you mentioned video recordings, audio recordings, a lot of the companies that are administering proctoring services are collecting far more data than they need to actually administer the test. So um, we actually ran a bill in California uh, as EFF that was looking to minim as a first step just to minimize the data that these companies collect. And we heard from students who said, yeah, they asked for, you know, health information, they asked for immigration status, they asked for all kinds of things, you know, ostensibly for verification so that you are, you know, they can say that um, you are, they can be assured that you are who you say you are, but that's really far more information than they need and then there are no real limits on what they could do with that information. So that is another big risk for me. Yeah, and re directly related to that, so the Ogletree case, which we'll talk about soon, this is the, there was a case in Ohio re that came out, I think last week or two weeks ago, that said that, um, a public university requiring a search, or not even requiring, but implementing a search of a student's room before a test was uh, an unconstitutional search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, the Cleveland State University, yeah, Cleveland, Cleveland State. So um, Cleveland State University actually reta not only retained the photos of people's rooms, but they actually let other students look at the photos of those rooms which I thought was just a very strange, like, why would that be your policy? I don't know. Um, I'm guessing it was probably an oversight or that no, just no one was paying attention and there was a place to, uh, that there was a place that the pictures were uploaded and it just happened to be available to everybody. But that's the kind of like lack of foresight and thinking that is, that contributes to privacy violations. Um, and yeah, so that, that's one, one harm. Another is just security risks in general. You are letting a third, a third party stranger, access your machine, see your room. Um, if there's any like private materials in your room that you, you know, you're supposed to like secure everything in your room. And so you don't accidentally, you know, give away your tax information, which was also in the other case. Um, but you know, if you make a mistake and you don't do that, that then that information is just available for other people to see apparently. Uh, did you want to come up to the mic if you had a question? disciplined him because that was deemed a violation of the school's no to zero tolerance weapons policy because he had a toy gun in his own room when which was visible in, in on the camera yeah so the um my organization cet just recently put out a report on um why am i blanking on it because i have not <laughs> enough coffee uh i have it here Oh, maybe I don't. Anyway, on um, basically student monitoring mm -hmm. and found that it was a, a, an extensive survey of educators and it's, it found that <laughs> that, kind, that kind of like monitoring of student activity was more often used to discipline students than to keep them safe. And so that's the kind of thing of like, oh, you, you, you saw a toy gun in the room. We're going to discipline you for that instead of you know, actually trying to use the technology to keep kids safe. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that rights violations tend to multiply each other. You know what I mean? When you have one rights violation, it makes another rights violation worse. So in the case of, you know, high school or college students where you might have a pregnancy test on your bookshelf behind you, like now all of a sudden that becomes a reason for you to be suspected of other, you know, crimes now because, you know, behaviors have been made criminalized that are criminal that weren't criminal before. So that thing that you were just saying about being used to discipline, you know, I mean, it's not being used to help the student or counsel the student or, you know, do something 
to, you know, to even just investigate. The people who are watching are afraid that if they don't report a possible violation, then they could be in trouble. So, you know, all of us, you know, are then kind of turned weaponized against each other, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so to kind of to continue on the conversation of harms that we saw. So we've talked a bit so far about like the more like invasion of your, your physical privacy of your space because you have either um, an AI based tool or a human kind of like looking into your room um, and being uh, what some might consider invasive. But I think uh, something that I also saw, there were some stories that um, the automated tools were not able to identify um, darker skinned students. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, like Eric, can you talk a bit about the, the algorithmic harms and why that might have been the case that um, these proctoring tools were not designed with darker skin in mind? Sure. So yeah, we had a, a panel on algorithms yesterday that I'll try to summarize very quickly. Uh, algorithms are um, designed by humans, often carry the same biases as humans, and whether you test an algorithm on a representative sample of data or not will inform whether you're algorithm is discriminatory and so we've seen a lot of this um, happen over the court over the last several years of examples of you know facial recognition not not recognizing black people or uh, just like obvious glaring oversights that uh, companies just didn't train their algorithms on on a representative data set one particular area that my organization cares deeply about is uh, disability discrimination and we actually just published a report earlier this year on uh, the impacts of uh, or on disability discrimination in surveillance technologies, and that includes uh, in, in the education space and includes um, exam proctoring software. So um, often what we're worried about in, um, in disability discrimination is the, the chance of a false positive. So if you're a false positive is essentially the system flags something as uh, like you're cheating or there's there's something that's raising a flag for the the system but it is actually completely innocuous and so for people who have disabilities there's lots of ways that they can trigger those w where, where it's just a complete false positive like if there's facial tics if your eyes are you know if your eyes moved if you have adhd or something and you tend to look around a lot like that's that is a red flag for these AI systems and for a lot of disabled people that's just standard, that's just them existing. Um, people who need longer than average bathroom breaks, like there will be time, you'll have a, a timer set for how long you can take a bathroom break. It might be 30 seconds, it might be 60 seconds, but either way, like there's some people need to use the bathroom for longer and that that is sometimes related to disability and so that's again another red flag that the system will will note but is actually just completely normal and the student is not actually cheating they just need extra time in the bathroom people who use screen readers might trigger uh, software that detects speech so some students some one form of cheating is like reading a reading a question and then somebody near you or in another room or whatever answers gives you the answer back so there's uh, there's speech recognition and so if you're using uh, a screen reader then that might trigger that uh, if you have to take medication at certain times of day and it happens to be during the test and you have to get up and the proctor doesn't let you or the AI system notes that you got up and then you came back, like that's that's another um, another potential false positive. Um, or even just reached for something. Yeah, or even, reached, yeah. Reached I mean, it's like yeah. there's a thousand reasons why you could be doing <laughs> any of these things and one of them is cheating and the other 999 are just totally normal things that people do every day. Does anyone take a test where they exclusively stare at their screen the entire time? No. Um, and I think the AI like, tries to build in some leeway, so you have to like trigger it enough times to get it reviewed, but it's still like, no one takes a test and stares at their screen the entire time. It's bad for your eyes, bad for your posture, it's bad for everything. It's probably so bad for your test taking. It's yeah. probably bad for your <laughs> test taking. Sometimes you look away and like think a little bit, um, and you know, one time out of a thousand, there's gonna be something printed on the screen that someone's reading but otherwise or uh, on the ceiling that someone's reading but otherwise it's just uh you know it's like the queen's gambit if anyone's seen that show where she looks at the ceiling and like sort of sees everything um that's n obviously not every time that happens not every time that happens is someone actually cheating uh one specific story we talked about in um in the report is actually related to disability and race. There was a woman who, uh, I think it was the bar exam, 
who so the the facial recognition couldn't see her face so she had to shine a very bright light in her face to get the system to recognize that she was sitting in front of the screen and then she ended up getting pretty bad headaches during the test because there was a bright light in her eye for several hours which would probably give all of us headaches and so obviously that makes your ability to, to take or pass a test uh, much much harder and so people um, who are forced to do this or people who are disabled in general are just at a huge disadvantage if they can even get the software to work they're under a huge disadvantage because they're limited in so so many other ways because they didn't train their algorithm or their facial recognition or their AI with everyone in mind they've they trained it with you know the average person in mind which of course is going to leave out a lot of people do you know I don't know if you know offhand was that the uh, the software company that recommended the, the light in the face or was that her school I mean, I don't know if it makes a difference, but just curious. I don't recall if I can find it. I don't think it said it in the report. Either way, it's not a very like, yeah. thoughtful workaround. Not- <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, I mean, it gets to some other, like, um, access and, and equality concerns, like equity concerns, I think I have, because, you know, obviously Eric, Eric just outlined a bunch of things that get flagged, right? If you're even a low income student and you don't have dedicated room to, to study and you know so other people might be talking around you other people might be moving behind you right it could get flagged that way if you um if you don't have a reliable internet connection right so if it drops occasionally um you know that could flag some things that could have like real consequences for you too so i think you know there are a lot of ways in which this the software while maybe perhaps trying to be more equitable actually also has a, has a lot of equity problems in and of itself yeah yeah when i took the bar exam remotely it required the stable test connection all throughout and um i was lucky to be in new hampshire where it's a very small group of people taking so it was uh, one person that i was in close communication with that was very understanding um, but if i had been in a bigger state where they just didn't have the bandwidth to give us that like one-on-one attention like if if I lost internet connection, like, at all during the test, I would have been, like, just marked as, like, you didn't complete that section. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is that is a very real concern because um, not everyone in the United States has a good, reliable internet connection. Um, and yeah, and like Haley said, I was required to be in an empty room. Um, I didn't have that option at my house to just, like, have a room that was empty. Uh, You don't have have a remote (laughs) testing room in your house? Uh, So many of us have just (laughs) empty rooms in our houses. Yeah, because I didn't have a place to to relocate my bed, Uh, so I took it at the school, uh, but I was within walking distance to the school, so that was a nice option for me, but uh, some schools had just kind of closed at that point, and students uh, were forced to like like get hotel rooms Mm -hmm. um, and so that just adds to the cost but uh, like yeah if you're a college student you're taking exams on like a fairly regular basis and uh, it's it's a huge like equity issue which is tough because it's also trying to solve uh, for an equity issue Um, (laughs) yes uh, sorry if you have questions you want to come up to the mic Or you can just shout really loud. (laughs) We can repeat the question, too. I was going to say first, uh, first, I started to see a bit on panels. Um, In any event, thank you so much for mentioning the disability aspect. Um, And I'm a university professor, and I'm so glad. I feel a lot better hearing what you guys have said, because I didn't use the uh, remote type it was called Proctor U. I don't know if I, mm-hmm. I don't oh, know yeah. the brand. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, but my son is, I, my husband and I have a, a, a son who's a junior at the same university, and I was asking him how did it, you know, work for them if he had to do it. And what really concerned me, because my husband is one of these people that looks off, you know, for a while to think, and the idea that it said, like, it told us they had, like, a training session, so they tracked the eye movements, and I'm going, what? And with the AI, and then even with the person there, they said the students would have to hold up their ID and then they have to take their cameras and like show there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. And in my view, you could put a book at your feet. I mean, really, I mean, you know, change it with your toes. How much is that going to show? So what I did wasn't optimal, it was the best we could do is I, and I was wondering if you guys had touched on Zoom as a, as a youth. It's breakout room. And in particular for my students with disabilities who had accommodations, 
I did, I asked them all if it was okay, because normally they would take the test together at a testing center, that, but I put them in one breakout room, and um, I monitored that one, and then I had like my grad, my trusty grad students monitor the other breakout rooms, and we set it up where like if somebody had a question, they could you know, um, text the grad student, and promise not to use their na phone number later, but text the grad student who will in turn contact me, and and I would you know give them because I wanted everybody to have a consistent answer right so give them whatever answer to clarify, but it was I, it was like for example I had a woman who had a uh, husband and a couple of kids and lived in a small apartment and she told me ahead of time look my kids may walk behind me and all that and and all these factors are so so very real but having said all that did. And forgive me, I came late. I'm sorry. I didn't no make worries. it over here as no fast worries. as I thought I could. Please don't apologize. Yeah, Khan yeah. is complicated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> did you guys um, touch on, on Zoom? And also, did you talk, or maybe you're going to talk about better ways to do this if we have to end up doing it again, you know, for the coming semesters? So thank you. We so hadn't much. yet, so that's actually a great transition, I think, to uh, transition a bit to Teddy. So. Yeah, is, is this the only way to take a test remotely? Do you have to have a human or an AI-based uh, tool <laughs> monitor you? Are there, there alternatives or best practices? or? So at, at the college level, and this is the only level that I can really speak to because I've taught you know, at university myself and I work with mostly university level teachers, um, there are so many other options as far as assessment. And the idea that a, a you know question and answer format has to be monitored by somebody in order for it to be valid is is not just is it's not just like bad in terms of privacy but it's also kind of bad in terms of pedagogy like there's no there are very few yeah there are very few um, college level reasoning tasks that get done by that kind of assessment you know just just fill in the blank or you know choose the right answer and so um, the idea that we have to do this at all um, is is kind of related to the idea that we have massified education and we want things to be very efficient we want them to be very cost effective we want them you know to get as many students in and out as possible and when you do that whether you're in a face-to-face -face environment or a remote environment something has to give right so the the process you set up where there's an actual uh, opportunity to ask somebody a question and there are live human beings that you can interact with and maybe a peer group you know so that you can do something that lends itself to problem-based learning where they're actually demonstrating that they can put to use the information that they have and that um, you know it, it's it's better in terms of privacy but it's much better in terms of pedagogy as well and even if you have to do this kind of question and answer um, evaluation there are still alternatives to actually trying to watch somebody do that and and a good one you know one that that is available to all of us no matter how many students we have is um, the idea that you are going to take this test you know, by yourself, you don't have to be monitored, you know, by anybody watching you, but then you're going to be asked in a, in a live situation to elaborate on a couple of your answers, right? So the student has to prepare for being asked to, to justify their answers. Um, that is a more effective way of, of trying to get somebody to learn because really, even though we're using tests to evaluate, they're also a really good learning tool. Like if, if the student is preparing for an evaluation that is learning oriented, then they're going to get more out of the class than if they're trying to uh, prepare for a test that is just regurgitation of information or fill in the blank or multiple choice or something like that. So yes, there are so many better ways that are better, not just in terms of privacy, but also in terms of learning. Yeah, one thing in particular, Sagan, so going back to the bar exam, um, I think it was either, Nev I believe it was Nevada. Um, so in 2020, the bar exams were delayed in every state because I, um, you know, it was the pandemic, people didn't know. Um, if they could do in person or not. So a lot of states, instead of all taking it at the same time, like usual, they were taking it at different uh, times throughout the year. Um, so Nevada saw that there were some of the problems that we have talked about, um, in particular, like students not having a place to take the exam, students not having reliable internet access. Um, and they actually made their bar exam open book for that one um, testing uh, cycle. So that's something that's like a pretty big deviation from how the bar exam typically operates, but that actually is in fact a lot closer to what it's like practicing as a lawyer. Yep. Um, I don't know if uh, any other lawyers in the room, but uh, I don't know if you your, your practice is all closed book, all from memorization. Uh, <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> Yeah, great. Right. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, I mean, that was why I was so happy 
You're right. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the thing. And if you design what I call an anything goes test, like you can, you could, you know, look at another source, you can call a friend, you can, you know, do any of the things you can do, um, then, then you have the opportunity to make more creative assessments. You know, if you're an MBA major, somebody can say, okay, given these constraints, how would you design a company, right? And, and, you know, obviously it would have more, it would have more specifics that would have more um, boundaries than that but then it's up to you to take everything in the world and then answer that question and as you said that that is going to be more like what you're going to do in real life nobody's going to say you can't call your friend and say you know what do you think about these ideas so and and it's hard you know it's more work and it is absolutely the case that there are some possibilities of, of introducing cheap, like you could get your friend to do the whole thing for you. You know what I mean? That's, that's still available to you. Um, but if you have multiple and varied forms of assessment, and especially if you have that live interaction part, like that's really a, um, it, it's not a magic bullet, but it solves a lot of things. If the students know that you might be, an, you might ask them to answer for anything that they have put on the test in an interactive situation with follow-up questions, then they're going to prepare differently. And even if they do have their friend, you know, ha help them, you know, construct this like you might in the real world. If they're responsible for ask, answering why this was the best choice and how it's better than the alternatives and you know, what kind of market research you did to determine that this is the thing, like you're, they're still going to get the benefit out of all the things that you were trying to teach them with that lesson. Did you guys have anything to add on best practices? Maybe not on like the, the pedagogy, but on just best practices, uh, if a school or an educator chooses to use any of this software. Because I know it's sometimes, unfortunately, it's at the university level versus right. the individual level. So if you, if you are an educator that is concerned about privacy, but your university perhaps mandates this, like what, what can you do? Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't, <laughs> I mean, you're I'm, in Illinois, you can sue them. Right? I'm, not my, I'm not my, there are many things I'm not, including a lawyer or an educator, but I do think, you know, we do encourage um, universities when they're looking at picking up the software, A, please evaluate whether you really need it or not, um, but also kind of look at the practices of the, of the company, look at the settings um, that are available. So, you know, can you do kind of a lower <laughs> a lower invasive setting. Um, so, you know, really make those evaluations carefully and deliberately. And, and, you know, if you can, obviously, like, bring in students, bring in educators, like, hear from them what they have to say about what they think would be the best practices for, for their own classes, because um, they are ultimately the ones who are going to have to use it, and they're ultimately the ones who face the consequences of when things go wrong. Really, the last thing that you want to do is set up a situation in which it's an arms race, and you know we can see this in so it's true you can see this in so many different areas like when when um, text matching software became really popular um, then students a learned how to evade text matching software and b they turned to bespoke essays you know just getting somebody else to write an essay for them rather than cutting and pasting from other things and that is like if you look at any prohibition that we have put in place to try to stop cheating you will just watch and see the response to that is you know a different kind of cheating or another like it that doesn't work that the arms race thing doesn't work and so in terms of what educators can do um, one of the things they can say is look every other time we've done this students have gotten around it how about if we try something that is not adversarial this is a great uh, transition um, so I actually was going to ask, I was doing a master's program and I emailed so many people at Georgia Tech and I was like, I really don't want to consent to putting this software on my computer. And they were like, well, you don't need the degree. <laughs> this is basically their response. So I started every test by saying into the camera, hi, my understanding is that uh, if you hear sounds, um, there's a program that flags every instance of this, and that needs to be reviewed manually by a person. So for the next three and a half hours, I'm going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, like there are tech, again, to your point, there are like ways you can do this. If you get a class of students say, hey, everybody like put a flashing light in the right corner <laughs> and just make random babble sounds. I have ADHD, so it also actually like 
helped me take the test better. <laughs> yeah. But it creates such an overload of information and an overload of flags that like no company that's organized to like do this for profit could possibly employ enough people to right. like review every instance of this. It just would be completely yeah. impossible. So I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts on just other ways people can also do things like that <laughs> and make the systems useless to hopefully I guess create that conversation that you're talking about because you know as a like somebody that was trying to get a master's degree and they're like yeah you know tough shit <laughs> like I can't imagine what it's like as like a high schooler like they don't care at all about right. yeah, they your have opinion to be there. no so I, I would love to just hear the panel's thoughts on things that like students can do in, in that situation to get back a little more power yeah, I mean, um, so, I mean, I love the sort of, like, I, like malicious I love this, compliance. Yeah, I love yeah. this malicious compliance. Yeah, some yeah. of those yeah. obedience approach that you've taken. <laughs> um, you know, we have been able to work with, I mean, our interest in legislation around this was certainly started by interest from student groups, right, who came to us and they were like, we really don't like this. Um, you know, it's... It's not like the sexiest thing, but we've had some successful petitions from from folks who've like gone to their university and been like, we really, really don't appreciate this. We don't like this. There's a better way to do this. So um, I certainly think organizing in that way, right, going uh, as a group of students who ultimately are the ones who pay tuition, um, you know, to kind of raise those concerns. I think that's that's one way that I would that I would flag for sure. Yeah, it's weird now that I have been all around the world. It's weird to me that here we don't have student unions. In other places, they have student unions, and the student unions have a voice in you know what software gets adopted. And you you correctly point out that these systems, you know, even though um, the artificial intelligence is complicated, it can be defeated by taking your test in front of a window that has birds outside it. Like it's just you know, I mean, it is not equipped to deal with life. To your point about you know all the different things that people have going on, so there are definitely opportunities for civil disobedience but to your point I think it, the the real power comes in banding together and just saying okay you know so you said tough shit I don't have to get a degree but now 200 of us in my program we, we're not paying next year's tuition unless we don't have to do this yeah and I, I don't remember which colleges but I know there were a small handful where students were able to successfully do petitions successfully kind of like shame their college into abandoning um, proctoring software. So um, CUNY, I think, was one. Yeah, yeah. There, were, there were a handful. And then, Eric, to your point, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, a BIPA and some special, um, a special avenue that Illinois students might have? Yeah, so um, you can always sue your university. Of course, there's lots of risks to that, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But um, yeah, so there's two ways, I think, the ADA, the Americans with, Dis American with Disabilities Act, uh, provides some some options if, of, you know, lots, lots of this, these AI are, are not, uh, are, are discriminating against people with disabilities, as I discussed. So there's that option. There's also uh, BIPA, which is the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is in uh, is state law in Illinois, which essentially requires uh, companies, generally, to get your consent before they collect and process your biometric information, which includes your uh, face and, and um, you know, facial mapping. And so there is a lawsuit uh, against Northwestern and DePaul universities because those universities required the use of the software and didn't allow meaningful opt-outs. Um, and I believe that is still ongoing, uh, but the, the fun little uh, wrinkle in this case is that the universities are claiming that they are financial institutions and thus they are exempt from BIPA's requirements. So oh, we will. I did see not know that. The SEC then? <laughs> yeah, we'll wow. see. We'll see uh, what happens with that argument. Um, Maybe a nonprofit financial. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I just I kind of wanted to add this a little, a slightly different perspective, also a faculty member. I appreciate the civil disobedience of singing through the exam, but um, a lot of times that has to be monitored by the faculty member. It's not actually AI that goes back and checks all the flags. 
And that actually brings up a conduct issue. If you have a belligerent faculty member, there's usually something in the student code of conduct where if you do something like that, charges could happen. Like, and I wouldn't do that, but, and, and in fact, I don't use any of these softwares. I think they're terrible, but um, there, that this is kind of my concern is that how much of this could fall into to, to the category conduct, and then conduct standards are different from legal standards, right? Yeah. Most of the time Very it's just 51%, more likely than not that you were cheating. So if you go up to a, a, into a panel of people who are evaluating you, and they decide you're being charged with belligerent behavior or classroom disruption or something like that, and you sang through the whole exam, suddenly you also have a, a conduct, a, you know. And it would be very easy. Like, there would be no way to kind of get around that in terms of 51%, you sang through the entire exam. Like, that's it, there you go. Something could have happened. And I really, that's the part that really bugs me is that conduct piece is, it's so broad and it is so easy to bring charges on students and it's so easy to make them stick because of that standard. It's so different from the legal standard. Yeah. Well, and they're individual. Like here, we don't have strict conduct. Like there's no conduct code that transfers across universities. So, you know, one university might have a very strict one that in which you agree to adhere to any rules the, you know, the instructor sets for the exam or, you know, set by the university for the exam. Like that's just part of the code of conduct. And then in another one, there might not be any such you know, kind of rule like that. So it's not even um, fair from the perspective of, of just from one, you know, what would be a legal jurisdiction, but we don't even have a word for that when it comes to conduct. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely a concern. And you have probably agreed to adhere to the classroom rules, you know, when you signed your university acceptance papers. It is, I mean, it is another reason that I sort of like encourage people to talk to, at the institution level, because I do think, I mean, so all, all the things that you just said, and then also, you know, different age groups are going to have different, um, f like, feelings of ability to push back. Um, and so, you know, student proctoring already is in a situation where, like, the, the idea of consent is very hard, right? I mean, they were, like, tough. You, you could just not get your degree. That's not, that's not great. Um, and, yeah, I mean, obviously with younger students, um, you know, that's going to be harder to push back. So it is why I kind of I would like institutions to think about this at that level more, because I think if you rely on individuals to have to push back, that's that's a lot of burden on, on individual students. Individual students and individual instructors Absolutely. also don't have the same levels of power. You know, I mean, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're session to session staff, you cannot meaningfully push back against that if you want to work there again. 100%. Mm -hmm. So this isn't necessarily a question so much as a comment, but like with with the programs that you have to use on your computer, all computers are also not created equal. Like I have a Chrome, I use a Chromebook, uh, and although it's my person and it's my personal Chromebook, so my school isn't like installing uh, weird school programs on it, but. I physically could not use a monitoring software if I had to download it onto my computer because, the, like, any programs made for Chromebook just have so many problems and often don't work at all. Um, I feel like this is a problem with, like, fi with financial differences between mm -hmm. students as well because a Chromebook obviously is, like, a cheaper option and if you just have that and not a computer that can run real programs, then you're going to have a lot more trouble trying to do this. And if you live in an area where your school can't give you a school issue computer, mm -hmm. then that is a significant problem with this. Yeah, it makes it to where there's like a, a cost threshold to even be able to take a test or to participate in your own education. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to, and to put it in really stark terms, like if you're a student who's relying on the school to provide you with a computer, then you have to deal with whatever they have put on it. Whereas if you are a student who can afford your own gaming level computer, then you have a whole other set of options, you know, because it's yours and because it, it runs fast and it runs everything. I mean, that, that difference by itself is really unfair. Yeah, I think student monitoring software could be a whole additional panel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> So apologize in advance, this is like a real raw topic for me because my son came home in the middle of sophomore year. We were living in a small apartment because I, you know, so I got a very, very up close view of his having to deal with online learning and online testing. 
and it was not good. It was very bad. Um, but one of the things that really kind of stuck out for me, and, and I'd like you as a, a academic integrity and also maybe the professors, and there seemed to be just this presumption of guilt that mm -hmm. you're all cheating. Of course you're cheating. And, and that was offensive, and it, it, it colored, you know, the way that, you know, they, the, the, the settings, you know, they, they, the settings they put on the software, the whole look away, you know, eye tracking. And, yeah. and when you were mentioning, you know, why do we design our tests in a way that they are, you know, first of all, they're, they're prone to be cheated, and that the sec and in the second place, they're not really accurate tests of knowledge in the first place. Yeah, not usable knowledge. Right, right. <laughs> and, and maybe, you know, is is cheating that pervasive, or is it just the way that? <laughs> now you're going to make me give you the bad news. Yeah, just, okay. cheating, cheating it. Like we we have done. Um, well, the Center for Academic Integrity, which by the way I'm not the director of anymore, but the Center for Academic Integrity has done about 25 years worth of of the same survey, and about a third of students admit to some form of evaluation cheating. So like test cheating, or you know. A significant homework cheating so you know I mean there there is definitely a big problem with cheating and and that would take a whole other panel to kind of unpack why there is so much cheating but a lot of it has to do with the fact that the students don't value the activities that are happening or it hasn't been explained to them what the expectations are in a way that makes them understand that it's to their benefit to actually not do the thing right if you if you just give me a random role and I, you know, I'm part of an academic integrity community, but if you just give me a random rule and there's no reason for it and I think it's stupid, the chances of me adhering to that rule are much less than if I understand and I feel like I'm part of a community, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the problem with cheating is a big problem, but here's the flip side of that that makes it so important that we get this stuff right is that because it is so pervasive, because, and, and by the way, that's over a year. So like a third of students admit having done something, between a quarter and a third admit having done some kind of cheating over the past year. So they're not cheating on every single thing. They just might have cheated on one thing in the year. But because it's so pervasive, wherever we focus our attention, we're likely to find it, right? So if, for instance, we have a student who has ADHD or we have a group of students who have ADHD and that flags the software and then we look more closely at them, the chances are we're gonna find some cheating there, right? And that that confirms our bias that these this particular group of students cheats, right? And then we're gonna look at them more intensely. We're gonna like make the algorithm look at them more, right? Because these are human systems that are going to reflect our biases. So if we get this wrong, we're gonna find cheating where we look for it, and then we're gonna be inspired to look for that more in that particular group. And that's gonna be brutally unfair to those students because the other students who weren't focused in upon you know, might be just as likely to have committed that, but we weren't focusing our attention there. Uh, I'm in high school, and I think a lot of a lot of these like issues with like remote test taking, and about like the power difference between administration and like students are kind of compounded on like when the students are younger, and so it's like it's just very frustrating to have like even at the university level at least you're an adult you can do things it's very frustrating to like not have that kind of power as like a 16 year old 15 year old during covid can i ask uh, what type of uh, remote testing environments you experienced or what features we just had a lot of zoom <laughs> we had a <laughs> yeah uh and so i was actually in middle school when the pandemic started uh and so like in the very end of 20 very beginning of 2020 and so we just had zoom tests and also during that time my computer was terrible mm -hmm. and so zoom and like anything else could not run together so it was just very frustrating um coming from that like inability to functionally take tests and that also being like you know, 14, 15 completely interfered with my, like, mental ability to take tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just wondering, like, how are the high school, how are, like, high schoolers being, like, regulated uh, as, as well as, like, university students? I know 
almost nothing about high school. So no. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah I mean, I do know that we see the more like facial recognition based tools less in high school, and it is closer to like the Zoom or like the teacher watching you. But I think that, uh, to his point, uh, there might not be the same like algorithmic harms, but there's the harms on like like mental health because I think that is like somewhat the the intention behind some of these tools is mm -hmm. that like you know you do a room scan that doesn't necessarily mean that you you aren't gonna cheat that whole hour I think it's like somewhat of a mental thing to kind of say like okay like we've scared you so much into not cheating but uh, to his point that takes away from your ability to focus on the exam and it kind of just continues to perpetuate the the idea that like students are always being being watched always being monitored um and perhaps eric you can touch maybe on just thoughts on student monitoring generally because i think what he has brought up is very similar like in terms of like mental uh aspects yeah, I mean, taking an exam is always an anxiety-inducing experience. It sucks. Um, and, you know, I've taken my fair share of exams over the year and over the years, and they're... I, I, I've been lucky enough that I've never had to take an exam rem with remote, uh, remote proctoring, but I can only imagine just the added anxiety of, oh, if I do something wrong... I'm gonna get flagged for something, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna have to go through a whole different thing to be like, oh no, I was just like talking to myself because I talked to myself. I wasn't reading something to someone else or trying to cheat or whatever. And um, yeah, it is sort of a, you know, the the in, the prevalent I, the prevalence of cheating is an interesting point because people are yeah people are just inherently distrustful of students. And it really sucks, and particularly for the honest students who are like, I just want to do well and pass and I studied in advance and blah 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 and you know maybe it maybe it's just a, a sign that we just need to get rid of closed book closed book tests anyway I mean back to the the bar exam like I wouldn't have had time to look at a book during the bar exam there was not enough like you basically had enough time to read the question and you had maybe a, a minute to think about the answer to that question and then of course you develop your own strategies to like well if you don't immediately know the answer to this question then come back to it later but like I wouldn't have had, like, if I had been taking the test in Nevada in 2020, I wouldn't have had time to take advantage of the open book nature of, of the exam, because it's just, they don't give you enough time. So, yeah. It's not a question, but I just wanted to commend the being, I don't mean to embarrass you, but, I mean, at your age, and of all the things you could have come to your grandpa, <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, yeah. Yes, we, we definitely impressed. want to commend our students. <laughs> but, but I just compliment your thought process to point that out. It wasn't just like, ah, complaining. It was like, how do I deal with this? I'm sorry, he's turning a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, I have two kids. <laughs> um, for the benefit of the recording, we're really, you know, commending the, the the student questioner who came up and, and is thinking about this. I think that is one thing that in the legislative work um, that I am really encouraged by is that, you know, in terms of like who we're seeing ask for this legislation, it's really coming from students and it's like very gratifying for me. Yeah, I think we hear a lot like, oh, the younger generation, they don't care about privacy, they privacy's dead, blah, 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 like, you know, all the privacy nihilism stuff that I absolutely hate. Um, and this is one area where, you know, we've really, um, I, it's been encouraging to see students take the lead um, to really talk about their own experiences. Um, and so, yeah, please um, keep doing what you're doing and come back with more of you. <laughs> could, I, could I tag on to that and just say that also it's not the end of the world that as many students are admitting to cheating in these surveys as they do because, you know, these ages we're talking about, high school and college especially, are ages when people are supposed to be testing limits, testing boundaries. Like if they have the idea that cheating doesn't matter and they get in trouble and then they realize, oh, you know, this is important for these reasons, and the school or the instructor or somebody helps explain to them why this is important, that is not the worst thing in the world. 
You know, I mean, that's it. And people are always, you said um, nihilism with, with respect to that. The cheating nihilism, too, like this has been going on forever. Pliny <laughs> the Elder talked about students using other students' work. Like, it's, it's really an age-old problem, and it's not kids these days. It's just, like, what people do when they're in a new, new situation and figuring out how to be in that space. It's not the end of the world as long as we, you know, address it and make sure they know why it's important to us that they actually know the things that our certifications say that they know. So the question I have is based on, is there been any studies or any statistics that talk about what percent of students are being uh, flagged as potentially cheating and what percent of those are actually being concluded that they did cheat? Because it's kind of curious because how can a student say, prove I didn't cheat? And these are just flags of behavior that don't prove you cheat how is that process playing out? I mean, there might be studies, but I don't know because my, my understanding is it's very uh, individualized from university to university. Um, it seems like typically what might happen is there's, there's a human review process. And I think like if you are going to deploy these tools, we, uh, it's a best practice to have that human review process. Um, but then from there, it really varies. Sometimes it's the faculty member making the decision. Sometimes like it would then be brought to like, like a review board. Um, I don't know if the, any of the educators in the room want to speak to this, but like it really like heavily varies like institution mm -hmm. to institution. Um, so I am a conduct officer at the university that I work at, which I will decide not to identify right now. Um, <laughs> there. <laughs> and so, and, and again, I don't use these programs. I don't like how invasive they are, but as a conduct officer, I see cases that come. So yes, uh, something's flagged. The faculty member reviews it. If they decide that they want to pursue it, they can pursue it at that time. And, th and again, this is university to university, how, what happens next, right? The faculty member, if the student doesn't have a prior violation, sac faculty member can say, I think you cheated. And the student goes, I'm scared. Fine, I'll sign the paperwork. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And they now have a violation. They can say, no, I absolutely did not. I want to go to a hearing. And they can go to a hearing, but that's when the evidence gets really tricky because the standard that's set at my university, and this is pretty common in conduct, is more likely than not. So if they don't have, they never went to disability services and registered as ADHD, even though they are, and their eyes are moving around, I'm on a conduct hearing panel and I'm saying more likely than not, and I don't know that they have a ADHD, they don't have an accommodation, and their eyes are moving around, I'm kind of stuck. Like, I, I, I kind of feel like, based on the way the rules are written, I have to find them in violation, even if, in fact, there are other things going on that I don't know about. So it's, I, I find the whole process very problematic because it, it's so easy to find people in violation and yeah. remarkably hard to find them not in violation. Yeah. And another tough point is that like, it's, it's the software companies that have like created this tool uh, that have said like, okay, like eye gaze tracking like is an indicator of cheating. But like, to your point, like once the, once the software is deployed, it's all in the hands of the university. The university has very little visibility and the, like how the the product works, how the algorithm works, like if 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 any what evidence there is on like how um, the technology is a, an indicator of cheating, um, and so it's very tough to like have this tool that you've been given and then kind of try to make sense and like get into the evidence of it all. Yeah. And so and I think so. Examsoft was used by the California Bar. I think they flagged one third of people who took that test as cheating, which just seems. That, that's awfully high. And a lot of people take the California bar. <laughs> a lot of people take the California bar. That did trigger, you know, a bunch of a bunch of the people who took the exam, went to the exam board, you know, they got opinions from, from all kinds of people. So, like, you know, we've seen some pushback in that way, but it really is mostly up to just whoever's administering the test to sort of what they're going to do with that information. And generally, human beings are not good at telling like who's guilty and who's not like we're just not good at that if you look at somebody and they're really nervous you might think that they're guilty and it, it, it's just, it's a very very flawed system as you said which is also why the ai we create is also pretty bad at that <laughs> is, is there any evidence behind i mean does gazing around the room mean that you're cheating is there any proof of that or is that just something that the software company says well 
you know what we can track? We can track their eyes. Let's do that. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, I mean that's I, a question. Is there, is there any, I mean, are they just making shit up? Is there any evidence at all that these behaviors that they're tracking have anything to do with academic integrity at, at all? So when, I'll, I'll point to history and say that when we started doing tes text matching software, all of the companies went to universities and they said, this will solve your cheating problems. Like this is gonna you know, match who is plagiarizing and who isn't plagiarizing. And the fact of the matter is, is that they had reduced the very complicated act of plagiarizing to a few very easily detected things, relatively easily detected things, and equated those things. And I think, although I'm at only the beginning stages of, of looking at this in detail, I think that that's probably what's going on here. Like, yes, gazing around the room could mean that you have notes on your, you know, on your wall or whatever, but it also could mean the things that you were talking about and to try to reduce, like I haven't seen any evidence that actually proves that and it's also really hard to prove. You know what I mean? So, I, have you guys seen I mean, any I think evidence? it's, it's impossible know. to prove because yeah. people yeah. look around for lots of reasons. They could be bored. Yeah, I think right. this, this perhaps is one of those instances where like there was a technology that was quickly deployed in response to a situation, but like as as we get further and further away from like the crisis of like those first couple of weeks of COVID, like people are taking a more critical eye and really like seeing like, oh, there was perhaps not a ton of evidence, but perhaps none at all. And, you know, really vetting company essentially marketing claims, right? About accuracy. Yes. <laughs> right. So, yeah. If I could also, with one observation, is that a lot of the behaviors that are collected and described as like this indicates cheating are all of the behaviors that like I had growing up going to school being like really severely ADHD. It's just the same list mm -hmm. of shit that I got sent to the principal for. <laughs> it's the right. same exact list. Mm -hmm. so, I just, I feel yeah. like that probably has something to do with it. I'm sure you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're at time, but on a final note, does someone like in like 60 seconds want to talk about that Ohio case where, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. in terms of like responses to these uh, problems and like what's been happening since, because like this is still very much like an evolving area. I mean, I have no idea how the university is responding. Obviously, I'm assuming they're no longer requiring the, the room scans. Um, but essentially, yeah, Cleveland State University required, or didn't require, but there were some instances where like a professor could require room scanning prior to an, an exam, and uh, the plaintiff, Ogletree, didn't want to scan his room because he had medications and tax documents that he wasn't going to be able to secure before uh, the testing time. And then um, the court basically said, this is a person's home, not only a person's home, but the, person, the person's bedroom. They have basically the, high, the highest expectation of privacy you will ever have is in your home and specifically in your bedroom. And the government didn't have, or the, the university didn't have any countervailing benefit that met the standard that would allow them to, um, to constitutionally ask for a, a room scan. So the yeah the the ultimate holding was that the search was unconstitutional and so Cleveland State will have to change that practice at least um, and most other uh, public universities will probably also have to change that practice. But, but this raise, doesn't apply to private universities. I was going to say you raise a good point about public universities versus private universities. So. Yeah, so uh, room scans at least in Ohio uh, are considered unreasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Actually, um, this happened very recently. I believe only like two weeks ago, and this is the first like very major case that we've seen um, with remote proctoring. So I think a lot of the people that are following this issue are really waiting to see like how this will impact um, the rest of the country. Um, because remote proctoring uh, has not gone away. Uh, it's something we're still seeing. And But again, uh, this is uh, public universities, not private universities. So uh, there's a really interesting dynamic there. Like if a bunch of public universities start to abandon remote proctoring, um, I think some people think that private universities might as well, um, but others think not so much. Um, so <laughs> There's probably a way for the government to say if you take federal funding for tuition that you also have to follow this rule, yep. um, but I don't, I'd have to look a little bit more into that before I could definitively say that that is true. 
yeah uh any final questions um if not we will be up here hanging out for a few minutes um if not uh thanks i really want to thank everyone in this audience yeah this is a great audience